Back in 2022, I went through a drawn-out and ill-tempered breakup with my then-fiancé, Savannah. She'd been getting unusually close to one of her co-workers, and her behavior had suddenly shifted. I accidentally overheard one of her phone calls, revealing that the two of them were, in fact, having an affair. I confronted her about it, and she didn't bother to hide it anymore. This was about a week before we were supposed to go on a couple's retreat that we'd planned for months, so instead of a five-day weekend with my bride-to-be, it was aiming to be a miserable pity party. But hey, the deposit was non-refundable, and I needed space. I decided to go on my own while she packed her things. I couldn't bear to watch our life being put into boxes. I headed for Alaska. Now, one might not think of Alaska as the first place to go for a vacation, but there are some amazing ski resorts up there. There was this one place that had a little bit of everything, a main lodge with a bar, a restaurant, and a gym. Nothing huge, but more than expected. Savannah and I had rented one of the many two-man cabins, complete with a built-in sauna. Thing cost an arm and a leg, but it came with complimentary champagne, so what the hell, I got there an early Thursday morning. I checked in and explained to the receptionist that there wasn't going to be a second person joining me. It earned me my first sympathetic look and an involuntary, oh. I was shown to my cabin. It was in a cluster with six other cabins, a straight walk from the ski lifts. One of the staffers showed me how to work the sauna bucket and all, where to find linens and how to order room service. Then they handed me the keys and sent me on my way. Savannah and I got the place a little cheaper because of how far in advance we booked, so we had no idea that it was going to be such a rough winter. There'd been a constant overcast for about a week, and we'd booked a little earlier in the year than one should, meaning it was oppressively dark outside, even at the height of noon. All I saw was a gray-washed sun peeking through layers of clouds like a shy schoolboy. There were a couple of others there, though. In the cabin straight across from me were a pair of what can only be described as socialite hipsters. A man and woman in identical haircuts and matching outfits. They had customized prints on their shoulders with their Instagram tags. At first, I thought it was some sort of joke, but every single time I saw them together, they seemed to enjoy themselves immensely. Kind of made me feel bad for thinking less of them, to be honest. There were two men in their 50s. They weren't an obvious couple at first look, but you could kind of fill in the blanks to draw your own conclusions. I think they just wanted to get away. They didn't even bring any skis. They seemed pretty chill, spending most of their time enjoying the amenities of the lodge. There was one final couple next door, a man and woman in their early 40s. I got the impression that they were parents enjoying a weekend away from their kids. They talked on the phone a lot and had to repeat themselves, referring to your sister and your brother in a way that only a stern parent could. I caught their names as Tyler and Ginger, but out of everyone there, I think I was the one who stood out the most. This whole cluster was intended for couples, but the staff didn't have the heart to ask me to move. It was clear that something had gone wrong, and they just wanted to look after me. I got a complimentary breakfast, a couple extra chocolates on my pillow, and they always had this apologetic tone when speaking to me, like they were afraid that I'd break. To be fair, a couple of times I did. That first day, I spent most of my time in bed. I wasn't even tired. I was just hurting from all the empty space and lack of noise. I kept going back to my socials to see if Savannah had posted anything. I kept updating over and over again. It was well over 7 p.m. when I realized I'd spent all day doing nothing but wallowing in misery. I decided that I was gonna at least try to make the best of it. I let the battery on my phone run out and left it empty while I headed for the bar. I didn't spend too much time or money, but just enough to get a chat in with some of the guests. There were single people and friend groups there too, but only about a handful. By chance, I ended up spending the evening with my next door neighbors, Tyler and Ginger. They confirmed immediately that yes, they were indeed exhausted parents. I offered them a sympathetic mojito and after that, we were best friends. Tyler was this enormous, lanky man, easily 6'6 and bald as an egg. Ginger, on the other hand, barely reached 5'4". 
You could tell she'd been stressed. It carried under her eyes. That didn't stop her from laughing herself silly at every stupid joke we made. It might have been the mojitos talking, though. Later that night, I ended up taking a smoke break with Tyler out back. I hadn't smoked since college, but I figured now was as good a time as any to ruin my life a little. He handed me a lit Marlboro Red leaning against the railing. I'd been telling Tyler and Ginger about Savannah and our recent breakup, and he was in full guy support mode. At least there are no kids involved. He sighed, sucking down his cigarette. It gets hella complicated, you know, and fast. But it's worth it, right? I asked. Tyler grimaced, bobbing his head side to side, making a little unsure hand gesture. Depends, he continued. I mean, they're going to suck the life out of you. It's going to be every day, every way, all the time. There ain't no you anymore. It's us, you know. Yeah, I nodded. I get it. He finished his cigarette, flicking it into the snow. But you can see it. You can see yourself in another person. It's hard to explain, but it's like, that's you. And unless you really hate yourself, you can't help but to love them. So it's worth it then. Tyler snorted, heading back inside. He blew the last puff of his cigarette out his nose, or it might have just been hot air mixing with the cold night. I'm theirs. I stayed behind, looking over the dark snow. Nothing gleamed or glistened. It was like a frozen black ocean as far as the eye could see, not a single star twinkling above. The entire resort felt like something lost in deep space, isolated and displaced, a monument to comfort in a subdued wilderness. I could see the others debating what song to put on for karaoke. They were going to drag me up there eventually, too. I didn't mind that much. I can do a decent killer queen. I turned back towards the endless snow a final time, and I swear something glimmered, and it wasn't the snow. Eyes? I woke up close to noon the following day, the result of one too many drinks and not a single alarm set for the first time in years. I drank what felt like a bathtub's amount of seltzer, threw up, and grabbed some takeaway lunch from the restaurant. Got my wallet back too, not that I'd noticed ever losing it. As I headed out, one of the receptionists stopped me. She gently grabbed my arm, excusing herself. Did you see a woman here last night? She asked. About 5'7", dark eyes, blonde hair. No, uh, was she here with anyone? That's what we're trying to figure out. She smiled. We think there's an unregistered guest. She's not your missing plus one, is she? I shook my head, causing a temporary motion sickness. I reassured her that I hadn't seen anyone matching that description and promised to let her know if I did. It was strange. She seemed a lot more worried than I thought one might be about an uninvited guest. I took some time to actually go skiing that day. There's something mind-clearing about plummeting down the slopes without a care in the world. No one to break your stride. Free reign as far as the eye could see. I lost track of time and ended up spending a little longer than anticipated. That evening, I got to the restaurant just as they were about to close. I managed to sneak in an order for a plate of chicken carbonara, but I was the only guest left eating something. The others were at the tail end of dessert. That's when I heard some commotion from one of the other tables. Looking up, I could see the two men from the other couple's cabin. It was a proposal. The whole lodge erupted into cheers, free drinks from the bar, hugs and kisses all around, and I was stuck sitting there with my plate of pasta. To round out the proposal, there was a short firework display outside. Blue and green rockets against the coal black sky, lighting up the snow like sand dunes of emerald and sapphire. It was beautiful, and I didn't even get a good look of it. As guests funneled back inside, I finished my plate. I was about to go congratulate the couple and join the budding party when I heard a knock. The restaurant staff were too busy closing up to notice it, but I saw someone outside. She couldn't have been older than maybe 20, 21. She wore a thin black nylon jacket and a trucker cap, resembling some kind of catering crew. She gave me a little hand wave, pointing to the door. You mind letting me in? Sure, yeah. Strange. The glass door was already unlocked. I thought she might have been locked out. Thanks, 
She smiled. Must have pulled at it the wrong way, sorry. She pushed past me, but turned with a smile as she did. Her eyes weren't just a dark brown that they were almost black. You should join us, she smiled. It's gonna be fun. She disappeared into the bar crowd. Her smile faded behind a blonde ponytail the second she thought I wasn't watching. It took me a moment to realize she matched the description of the woman the receptionist had been asking me about. I tried getting a hold of a staffer, but they were running about like headless chickens. After a short but valiant effort, I decided to celebrate with the others. After all, it was Friday night, and I needed a reason to drink, or a better reason at least. Things got a bit hazy around midnight. The newly betrothed were off in a corner, sharing a bottle of red. Tyler was trying his best to keep Ginger from a fifth cocktail. The hipster couple had retired early, choosing to spend the remainder of the night in their cabin. Other guests filtered out one by one, leaving a handful of people behind. As I stumbled back to my cabin for the night, intent on spending some time in the sauna, I noticed this strange blonde woman in the distance. She was standing outside the hipster's cabin, knocking on their door. She looked back at me with an expressionless face, her dark eyes looking like holes in the head. I could tell something was off about her. I always could, but I didn't know exactly what. I spent the night in the sauna, not by choice, but happenstance. I didn't even start it, I just put my head down on a towel and blacked out. By morning, I was more hangover than man. It was also the only time the sun decided to peek out, if only to tease my retinas. I spent some time getting ready, munching on a couple of protein bars and chugging a bottle of orange juice I'd nicked from the open bar. Just past lunch, I was the only one on my feet. I didn't spot any other guests from the cluster and all the cabins were closed. No sign of the strange blonde woman either. Maybe that was for the best. But the more I wandered about, the more I noticed something was off. The ski lift wasn't working and most of the main lodge was locked. All the lights were off, both inside and out. The restaurant's curtains were drawn as well as at the bar and the reception. The gym was locked with a closed sign out front. I tried knocking, but no one opened. I tried the main lodge and the other cabins, nothing. I looked all over the resort, but it was all empty. The parking lot, the maintenance shed, changing rooms, everything was either locked up tight or empty. Something must have happened. One of the side entrances leading to the restaurant kitchen was not just locked, but chained up. Going back to my cabin, I checked my phone, only to remember that I'd let the battery drain. There was no power to charge it. The temperature was also going down, fast. It didn't take long before I had to bundle up with a jacket, even indoors. By the time I realized I'd run out of options, the sun was already setting. I sat on my bed with my legs huddled up against my chest, looking out the window. The snow had stopped glistening as the sun had, once again wrapped itself with a cloud cover. That's when I realized what bothered me about that strange woman the other night. There was no vapor coming from her breath, no hot mixing with cold. It was as if she hadn't breathed at all. By nightfall, I could see movement in the distance, doors opening, lights turning on. There was laughter coming from the main lodge, a few remaining fireworks from the other night flaring up into the night sky. Someone had cranked up the music in the bar a little too loud. Heat was coming back and power was restored. I fumbled for my phone, plugging in the charger. As I did, I spotted one of my neighbors through the window, one of the two older betrothed men. He looked ecstatic, skipping through the snow like a child. He lost his glasses as he haphazardly threw snow into the air, leaving an arc of snowflakes slowly tumbling back to the ground. I walked up to the window ready to call on him. I wondered where his fiancée was, but I only had to wonder for a moment. His fiancée was dragging the headless corpse of the hipster woman behind him, colorful jacket and all. I crouched down, covering my mouth with my hands. I didn't want to scream to slip out. I could hear my chest pounding in my heart, making me twitch with every beat. I felt my cheeks flush as my tongue went dry. They dragged the body through the snow, their hands and faces covered in red. There was a long trail of blackened blood reaching all the way from the hipster cabin to the middle of the field. 
The two betrothed kissed, laughed, howled, and cheered. They waved at someone off in the distance, screaming with joy, and there was no vapor coming from either of them. No hot air mixing with cold. They were cold as ice, and just as pale. I saw it all from my bedroom window. Cleaners hanging bloodied linens out the windows like war banners. A woman throwing torn body parts off the roof of the main lodge. A gang of four restaurant workers set fire to the maintenance shed, dancing around it like shrieking primates. The receptionist who talked to me earlier was wandering in a circle out near the back entrance. She had knives stuck through her arms and throat, but was moving around like it was nothing. Her back straight and her movements precise, predatory. There was a glow in her eyes, a reflection of the raging arson. The pity I'd once seen in them were long gone. I frantically dialed emergency services. As soon as the call connected, my mind went into a lockdown. I couldn't decide whether to scream or whisper, so I ended up doing this strange wheezing. I had to repeat what I said three times to even identify myself. I have no idea what I even stuttered after that, but I managed to give them an address. I think I got the point across. People were dead and things were on fire. There was a knock on the door. My immediate reaction was to toss my phone halfway across the floor. I never hung up, I think. I figured whoever was outside might have heard the noise and came to investigate. Would you mind letting me in? The same voice as the other night. The blonde woman who I'd opened the door for at the restaurant. This time I didn't move. I didn't answer. I thought I checked this building. She chuckled. Where have you been hiding? There was a whisper. Someone was with her. Then, a giggle. You slept in the sauna. No wonder we didn't see you. I looked for something to defend myself with. There was a fireplace, but it was only decorative. There wasn't even a fire poker. I grabbed my empty bottle of complimentary champagne. It was heavy enough to cause some damage, but as I looked at that closed door, all the fight ran out of me. There were so many of them out there. I counted nine in total, surrounding the building. Dark shadows pressing up against the window, none of which were fogging up the glass. Not a single breath, not one. It'll be quick. Her voice was muffled, but only barely. It would be so easy for them to break through. It was just glass, and yet, none of them did. Open the door. Of course I didn't. I grasped the bottle tighter, hoping against hope for them to just... leave. Instead, there was another knock. A slap on the windows. A few familiar faces with an unfamiliar glow in their eyes, looking my way. I heard you went through a rough breakup. She sighed. We're a community. There's no loneliness on this side of the door. Something in me snapped. It was one thing to hear someone talking, but now they were talking to me specifically. Those words were meant for me, no one else. There was no way to trick myself into believing this wasn't happening. A reflex made me throw the bottle against the door, but it was useless. The bottle thumped against it and rolled away. They all erupted into laughter. A bloody handprint slapped against the window, then another, then an eager tongue, licking it up like a thirsty cat. All right, she laughed, then we'll make you come to us. The restaurant workers in the distance stepped up. They were using empty beer bottles from the other night, filled to the brim with a rag on top. Molotovs. I didn't have time to go for my phone and I couldn't leave. The first place I could think of was the sauna. It was at least heat resistant. It could buy me some time. I hurried into the sauna as the first heat wave pushed the door shut. Bottles were being thrown through the windows, shattering against the bedroom floor. They cheered, singing a scream rendition of London Bridge at the top of their lungs, blood-curdling falsettos. Six bottles, one by one, added to an inferno. The smoke was already billowing into the sauna, staining my lungs. There was no option left. I had to get out. I'd die if I didn't. I dipped my sauna towel in a bucket of water and wrapped it around my head. I tucked my arms into my jacket, covered my face, and considered my route. The shortest way was the window facing the rear. A sharp turn to the left and then straight forward. I plotted it. I envisioned it. 
and as laughter drowned in the crackling flames, I felt my tears grow warm, and I ran. One step outside and there was already something on me sizzling, pain on my shoulders like a searing sunburn. I could feel my skin flaking. I stepped down with my right foot, turned, and leaned into a sprint. It wasn't a conscious decision. I wasn't as much running as falling with purpose. And as I crashed through the window and air surged out around me, I threw myself into the snow by force of body weight alone. I didn't stop. Stopping meant death. Instead, I kept sprinting forward in a pace that knocked the breath in and out of my lungs like a piston. I threw the towel off my face, feeling the chill night air burn against my exposed shoulders. I was burned but I couldn't stop to check how badly. Most of them were too busy howling and cheering to even care. Some of them were occupied with suckling on something raw and bloody. Others were too busy enjoying each other's company. Some of them were pointing my direction. One of them fired a gun, but the shot went wild. There was only one that remained focused and calculated. This wasn't a game to her. This was survival. I made my way around the side of the main lodge, following a blood-spattered trail in the snow. The ground was cluttered with miscellaneous furniture thrown from the second floor window. I could see breathless faces peering out at me, but they didn't seem to care. Maybe they thought I was one of them. Maybe they thought they'd already won. Maybe they had. As I rounded the corner to the parking lot, I saw a familiar face. Ginger. She was perched on the hood of a car in nothing but her underwear, barefoot, with the bloodied remains of Tyler splayed out in front of her. There were no tears in her eyes, just a blank-faced, thousand-yard stare. She was holding up his left leg, licking an open wound clean as she pressed and prodded the dead veins for blood to squirt. A crazy idea went through my head as I grabbed a handful of snow and stuck it into my mouth. I tried to calm my breathing as I stepped into her vision. Hiding my breath might trick her long enough to gain some distance. There was visible confusion on her face, maybe a hint of recognition. The snow kept my breath from turning to mist, making me look just as breathless as the rest of them. Ginger looked me dead in the eye as her face contorted into a snarl. He's mine, mine, she shrieked. He's all mine. She observed every step I took. She sucked air into her lungs, as if to make herself look larger, making an uncanny reverse hissing noise. There was no vapor coming from her breath as she exhaled. There was no chase. She already had her meal, like a house cat eating a St. Bernard. I had to get out of there. There had to be something I could do other than to run blind into the wilderness. By the south corner of the main lodge, there was a pile of clothes. They smelled of turpentine, but no one had lit them on fire just yet. Maybe they wanted to add more to it before they did. I stuck my hands in there, letting the chemicals sting my open wounds. Rustling through discarded shirts and pants, some of which still had limbs attached, I managed to find a set of car keys. I held on to it for dear life, thanking whatever gods may be for the little blue sunflower keychain I'd felt at the top of my fingertips. The keys lead me to a camper van. There was a small picture of the two betrothed men above the glove box. Since I'd seen them out in the field, I figured I had some time before they came looking for it. I put the keys in the ignition and my heart froze. There was a knock on the driver's side door. This is hardly a fitting domicile. Her. I fumbled the keys, trying to get the thing to start. The camper van was probably older than me, and I'm not good with driving stick, but I didn't have much choice. Invite me. That's... that's just it, isn't it? I cried, EU. You can't do it. You can't come in. You want to bet? Yeah. I nodded. Yeah, 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 let's bet. Let's do it. I was just buying time. The moment the engine roared to life, I stepped on the gas. A bloodied hand squeaked against the window as I took a hard right turn, making the tires slip on the graveled road. I saw it all in the rearview mirror. The fires and a gathering crowd. Some of them waved goodbye. Some cheered. All of them rejoiced, together, breathless. By the time I got to a nearby town, fire trucks had already passed me by. Once I talked to the police, they seemed to already know the story. To them, there'd been reports of arson, 
Several casualties, about eight in total. They had people on site investigating, but the people I'd seen out there celebrating a massacre. They were never reported as victims or suspects. In fact, they were seemingly just innocent bystanders. I've kept my eye on this for years. Some of the firemen who got to the resort that night have permanently switched to night shifts. Most of those who survived that night have mysteriously vanished from social media, but they still pop up in posts, very much alive and kicking. I've seen people who look suspiciously similar to Ginger and the two betrothed men. They didn't fake their deaths or disappear. They just made themselves socially invisible, slipped into the background. All deaths were easily explained. Arson. All they found were burned bodies, and the fire marshal in charge seemed less than eager to delve deeper into the causes. Most of the eyewitness accounts were taken on face value. Strange how the fire marshal first changed to a night shift, then fell off the radar completely. It was arson. End of story. No need to look closer. And my 911 call. No one ever heard about it. No wonder they didn't bother to hide it all from me. I was never a threat. They'd already done what they came for. That one woman, the one who didn't breathe, was the source of it all. And to the best of my knowledge, she is still out there. And she is not alone anymore.